This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and a very special welcome back to the Secretary of Administration, Kiana Connor. We thank you for being on again. There's a great deal happening in the, your secretariat in those four agencies. I commented when you were on the first time that I thought it was very unique that someone would have both an undergraduate degree in chemistry and then go on and get a doctorate in chemistry and then get interested in government and, and public policy. The chemistry of people now. Uh -huh. that's, that's a good way of, of saying it. And that, some of that started, I believe, during uh, Governor Warner's time that it started. That's right. And now Secretary of Administration, mm -hmm. Governor Northam, and with some real interesting initiatives going on, some of them with ongoing programs, but a new twist, a, a new angle. And one of them that it's open to people around the Commonwealth, and we were talking about the problems that people are having with student debt. Yes. And there's the five two nine. Mm -hmm. So tell us what's happening there and other initiatives that are trying to help people deal with the rising cost of college. Sure, David, thanks for having me back. Uh, when Governor Northam took office, he really gave us the task of looking at different programs that we could implement to help the Commonwealth recruit and retain the best employees. And so two of those incentives in which we rolled out in 2018 um, was an up to $10,000 contribution from the agency um, to a state employee's Virginia 529 account or to help that state employee with student loan repayment. So two separate initiatives. The agency must have this funding within their budget, but we definitely want people to use this, especially for those difficult to, uh, critical to fill positions. We were talking some about that, and there, there are some agencies, um, well, for example, probably the Department of Corrections, that right. often has lots of difficult to fill positions. Yes. And I think I have it right, and you correct it, because some people are going to be interested in this mm -hmm. as they hear it. You would need to be employed by that department first. That's correct. Before you get, you couldn't. Or it's a recruitment tool as okay. well. So we do advertise this for people as they're applying to state agencies. If it's a difficult to fill, fill position with a high turnover rate, then agencies would be able to use that as a recruitment initiative as well as a retention initiative. So you could be new coming into state employment or you could already be a state employee. And there are lots of positions, not just here in the capital city, but That's around right. the Commonwealth. Yes. And we'll put that website up and yes. direct them to it where they can check out yes. places where there are positions available. Mm -hmm. uh, how will they then be able, to, will they be able to contact the agency? How would they find out, are some of your positions hard to fill? Mm -hmm. Sure. And as you mentioned, Department of Corrections, that's a big one, as well as nurses across the Commonwealth. Um, I would advise anyone to check out the Department of Human Resource Management website, and that is dhrm.virginia.gov, for any job openings currently. Um, for any state employee that is interested in either one of these incentives, they should contact their human resource office in their particular state agency. Okay. So, and like you say, that's for not only retention, but the recruitment. That's so correct. if you're someone out there who's applying, yes. 
you They're can keep that in the, body, the back yeah. of your mind. Yeah. But again, it's an agency decision. They have to determine if it's a difficult to fill, high turnover position, and then if they have the funds within their operating budget to support it. Now you mentioned nurses. I know there's a nursing shortage, it seems to be statewide, nationwide, I don't know, maybe worldwide, I don't know. But, but a significant number of those nurses are state employees? That's right. And so that if you're in nursing in one of those state agencies. In you, one of those state hospitals. State hospitals. Mm -hmm. Then you probably are in a difficult yes. to fill position. Yes. And could get some assistance. Well, this is just starting. Does it start July 1? Has it already started? So these, both of these incentives are already in place. Ah, okay. So before the term of office ends, uh, as Secretary of Administration, we should be able to get some reports about how this is is hopefully helping retain and also then helping in the recruiting as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And the Department of Human Resource Management is constantly thinking about new programs that we can implement to address this challenge. The governor also signed Executive Order 12 last year in 2018, and that provided eight weeks of paid parental leave for state employees, and that's with a new child either by birth or placement in the home from adoption or foster care. So this is a great way for us to show state employees that we care, and that in order for you to do well at work, you also have to have that home balance. And so we hope state employees are taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, if, both state if both parents are state employees, then both are eligible for paid parental leave. Hmm. And and this is this is also new. This is new. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As I said, the governor really tasked us with looking at ways to make sure that uh, we were taking care of our state employees because they do great work on behalf of the Commonwealth, and we want to show them that uh, we appreciate everything they do. Well, I think when you when you when when someone starts comparing, and they realize all these benefits that that goes a long way, even if the job pays a little less in the private sector with That's all these, these benefits and with a good retirement system. Too. That's right. We're always trying to do what we can to stay competitive with all marketplaces. Now, um, there was something in the news recently in one of your agencies, Department of Elections. Mm -hmm. um, people have been concerned for some time about election security and issues, and there was something about a tabletop or something that was <laughs> happening and probably uh, just enough in the newspaper to be a, at least a good teaser, but yeah. tell, tell us more about this. Sure, so the Department of Elections two weeks ago hosted the first security tabletop exercise, and this was available to election security administrators and support staff all across the Commonwealth. We had a great turnout, and it was an opportunity for them to walk through simulations and scenarios for pre-election day as well as election day. So we partnered with Virginia Information Technologies Agency, VITA, as well as our federal partners the Department of Homeland Security as well as the FBI to put together a number of different scenarios that may occur. And we helped them respond to those. We made sure that there was good collaboration across the localities. If one person didn't have the answer, someone, has, someone else at their table did. So we thought this was a great opportunity for us to begin to predict the unpredictable. And that's what you really have to do with elections these days. You know, it is interesting that the that it's, there's assistance from the federal level that, it's, yes. that while the election, elections are state, mm -hmm. state run. Mm -hmm. Locally. A, yes, there was assistance there from the federal level yes. to help on that. Yeah. Now, so when some best practices are d developed then, are those then gathered from that ex and then passed on to, to other election officials? Absolutely, we have a great relationship with our federal partners. After 2016, we all had to take a step back and determine what we were doing to make sure that there was complete confidence in the electoral process. And I'll say our federal, federal partners really stepped up and they provide a number of resources um, to our local election officials as well as our state um, cyber part of VITA. Now, one thing about Virginia is kind of interesting. Not it's not in every state, but we do have paper ballots. We do, and 
And that's been an interesting history. We had them, we didn't have them, we have them again. Yes. So why do we have them? And let's say they're here to stay. Uh -huh. um, with technology, Virginia kind of went through a transition. At first we had a paper ballot, then we went to an electronic voting machine, and now we're back to a paper ballot. And the primary driver for that was making sure that you had a paper trail after the election. So if there was any questions or if there was an audit needed, you had something that you could actually go back, touch, see, and feel to do that. Uh, recount if necessary. With an electronic voting machine, a number of questions were raised from a security standpoint. Are they hackable? Are they not hackable? And I will commend Governor McAuliffe and his administration for taking that step to decertify all electronic voting machines in Virginia. We actually have uh, the beginning part of election taking place right now. That's I mean, right. We're having a conversation here toward the end of April, but it's already started. Yes, absentee voting has started in the Commonwealth. Ballots have been mailed to our military overseas. So we have a primary on June 11th. Um, all, all, one, all 140 General Assembly seats are up this year, as well as a host of local races. So the department is working very closely with our general registrars to make sure that we're all ready. Now you seem very relaxed and a smile on your face, but, but if you start thinking about what could happen that the Supreme Court could come through with a decision that, that throws all of this somewhat in, in chaos uh, for the 24 House of Delegate districts and then I suppose for all of the legislative districts that, that could really push it back. And I know people are anxiously and eagerly, hopefully, waiting to hear whatever yeah. the Supreme Court's going to decide. Yeah, David, I'll say we'll cross that bridge if we have to. Yes. At this point, we have remedial maps in those 24 districts that you mentioned already in place. The department worked very closely uh, with local um, uh, general registrars to validate those voters to make sure that they were placed in the correct districts. Um, if a decision comes back from the Supreme Court, we will do what, what is necessary to make sure that the election goes off as smooth as possible. I know here in, in the local media in the Richmond area there was an article about uh, a couple of examples of people that are now right now running in a primary that if the decision should turn that back to the original as they were originally drawn, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be even living in those districts. So it uh, could be quite a headache. Let me ask you too because people get interested in, and I know always interested in elections and we wish everyone were. That's right. But not all elections here during this primary season are really operated by your agency. Some are, are under the control of either the Democrat or the Republican parties. That's right. So what, what's, what's, the vari what's the mix out there? Yeah, so the Department of Elections, the State Board of Elections oversees all primaries. Uh, but uh, local parties have the decision to make and local legislative nominating districts as well. They get to choose their own primary method. If that will be a caucus, a convention, or a primary. If it's a caucus or a convention, those are put on by the local parties. If it's a primary, it is run by the State Board of Elections. You mentioned VITA yes. in, in passing, the Virginia Information Technology. Agency, mouthful. Yes. And, but there's something else about VITA. It was taking place with the elections, but also some kind of a tower system that they have. What? Yes. Uh, there's been some transition that you've that's taken place. That's right. For over 10 years, the Commonwealth had one single provider that provided all information technology services. Um, recently, the Commonwealth underwent a transition to a new multi-supplier model. So in this model, we now have eight different service providers that are providing service to us. The interesting piece about this is if there's something not working with one vendor, we have the opportunity to take them out and plug a new one in. So it provides the Commonwealth with more flexibility in the services that, that the eight provide. I'll also say that we hope that in the years to come it'll be a more cost-effective model for state agencies as well. Now with all the things that are happening in your four agencies, there's some interesting things happening here right on Capitol Square that that's, uh, uh, people maybe don't know about and there's a website that we can send them to. It's about on the On the Square yes. Virginia program. Uh huh. We call it On the Square VA and On the Square Anyway. 
anywhere. So as I mentioned, the governor, when he came into the office, he really had a focus on state employees and making sure that we were providing a, a welcoming environment for them. So as part of the paid parental leave, the Virginia 529 incentive program, as well as a student loan and, uh, repayment program, we have on the Square VA. And this is a host of activities here in Capitol Square, but we also encourage agencies out across the Commonwealth to adopt them as well. And these are activities that kind of get you up and moving throughout the day, especially during your lunch hour. We'll have our kickoff, our spring celebration on Wednesday, May 1, and we're really looking forward to having people out on the Capitol steps to engage in just some fun collegial um, activities. Um, over the course of the summer, we'll have food trucks here on Capitol Square on Wednesday, as well as a farmer's market on Friday. So a number of different things. We've been really pleased with state agencies that have kind of stepped up and taking ownership of events. So if there's something within an agency um, that they do on a regular basis, we're opening that up to all state employees. I would really encourage people to go on that website and check it out yes. if they're anywhere in the Commonwealth. That's because, uh, as you were saying, it's not just here in the Capitol Square in, in Richmond, as, as interesting as everything is, an opportunity for people in their in their town, mm -hmm. their county, their city, to, to set up something that would be somewhat modeled and there's some resources there to help them. That's right, and we're helping build community, right? As state employees, we all have something in common. We, we serve the constituents of the Commonwealth. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to use a few minutes, a half an hour, an hour a day, just to do something uh, with your fellow coworkers. Well, we're having the conversation, as I mentioned before here, end of April, or we're into the time in between sessions. Uh, any reflections that you would have as you look back on the on the session that's that's ended? Uh, I will tell our viewers that we're having the conversation before the absolute deadline of midnight May third for the governor to uh, act on any remaining legislation. So there may be some things that you can't tell us right now. That's right. But but what about the the session? Was it a a successful session for your secretary and your agencies? Absolutely. I'll say pay raises for state employees and teachers, are number oh. one on that list. Uh, so for state employees, they get a 2.75% base adjustment uh, to their salary, and that's big news. For, I think will help folks understand that we do care about the work that they do, and we want to make sure that as cost of living is going up, uh, this is an opportunity, I think, for the state to uh, to invest in their state employees. Some employees are also eligible for a 2.25 percent merit pay. So if they've been in service for the Commonwealth for more than three continuous years, they may be eligible for that benefit as well. And that would be full-time employment. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I'll note one others. Um, you know, something that the governor has been really focused on is no excuse absentee voting. Uh, in this past session, we got a limited no excuse absentee voting. And so, you know, when you go in to vote absentee, either in person or by mail, you have to give one of 20 reasons why you're doing so. Uh, with this new legislation, it doesn't come into effect until 2020, but you'll have an opportunity to do that without providing one of those 20 reasons. Uh, the, the first the two Saturdays immediately preceding election day. So so that's the limited part is, that's is the, the time part. the time frame. That's correct. That's correct. And and have there other states that have, have tried this model or tried it tried this and it's worked? So it depending on the state, um, some states have early voting. In Virginia sure. we really don't have early voting, we have absentee voting. Which probably becomes early voting and some is just not called that. Uh, but but this, this would be providing, as you said, greater flexibility. That's right. It's a step in the right direction. Well, are you uh, already looking forward to the 2020 session? Oh boy, we just got done. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the 2020 session will be a big one. This is the governor's uh, first really large budget of his own. So we're looking forward to being able to put into place a lot of the initiatives and the priorities that he has. And I'm sure a significant number of those will fall within your secretariat. I'll try my best. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, Secretary Connor, we thank you so much for being on this week in Richmond, and we look forward to hearing and reading and then having you back to talk about the, some of the successes, with particularly with regards to uh, recruiting and retaining state employees, the, the, the public servants that really serve all of us. Yes. David, thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Well, thank, thank you very much.
Welcome back to This Week in Richmond, and the roles have reversed because Haley Allison and Harrison Seaborn are going to interview me some uh, about what's, what's happening. I enjoy interviewing the guest, and I'm willing now in these five or six minutes we have for the two of you to interview me. So Haley, you start, and Harrison, you jump in. Okay, so um, the 2019 session has been adjourned now for about a month. So what can you tell us has happened since it's been out? Well, I mean, some of the money committees have already had their meeting. Uh, there's, a, there's a website to, where the General Assembly calendar's up. It's just, we go put, the, put it up, it's just LIS site. And those money committees meet monthly, except take a break sometime in the summer for a month. And while the General Assembly is not meeting in the House and the Senate, Many of the legislators are here for any variety of, of studies. Um, practically any day of the, the week, Monday through Thursday, sometimes on Friday, meetings are happening. And you've, you've been to some of those, you've seen how they are. Uh, Harrison, you're interning. What have, what have you observed or what questions do you have for me? Um, well, I was reading and I saw there's 150 roughly uh, um, Studies. Studies, yes, yeah. uh, and commissions happening right now in the um, interim period. Uh, and I didn't know a lot about that stuff. Uh, it wasn't really on my radar um, before I came in, and I was just wondering uh, if you knew a lot about that. Yes, well, that's an interesting because some, some of those are, you might say, a little bit dormant, and they're not meeting. Others of them are extremely active. And there, again, there's a website where those studies where you can look at all the different studies that are taking place. There were some studies that were authorized by the General Assembly in the 2019 session that haven't popped up yet to, to get underway. Some are actually authorized in the budget. And we're having the conversation a few days before the governor will be signing the budget. But once the governor signed it, there's some studies that are authorized in the budget. So it's it's a busy time, and I guess the, the main word is study, study, study that takes place uh, between, between the sessions. Um, it, it, some people think that, well, you really need to be involved when the session's going on, and that's true. But if you uh, take a nap and wake up and it's uh, end of December, and the governor's announced his budget, and the session's getting ready to start in January, it's really too late, because mm. there's much that, much that happens during this interim time. So you mentioned the governor's budget, and um, he has until Friday to sign. One thing that some viewers might not be aware of is that the General Assembly approved his budget, but he actually has the final say, so he can make some additions to the budget before he signs it, correct? Yeah, it's really, it is interesting. First time I observed that was several governors ago when it, when it happened to an issue that I was very much involved with. And by the time viewers are seeing this, the governor's already signed the budget, but we're having a conversation on the Monday before his Friday midnight deadline. And the governor has some real ability to impact the, the budget. He really can't, uh, as best I know, he can't go in and add things in. Uh, he can certainly go in if it's a freestanding part of the, the budget and just veto that that portion of the budget. So he has some, some ability there, and governors exercise that authority. Some say it may be one of the reasons why, I mean, the governors have a great deal of authority because the General Assembly doesn't come back again to see, do we agree with what the final things that I the see. I'm definitely getting done. the impression that it's like a year-long process, getting like the budget set up and the different studies and things. There's a lot going on just even beyond the session period. It's sure. certainly, certainly lots going on. The budget will be signed and localities and everybody will know what money they have. But there, there will be studies underway and with all different kinds of subjects and really encourage people to go on and look for those. In addition, there's one other site that people should check out and it's called Town Hall, mm -hmm. the Virginia Town Hall. And there you can see where the board of this and the board of that, I mean, they have their meetings that are announced, and they're all open to the public. And there is very, very little, if anything, that will take place that's behind closed doors. These meetings are all open. 
And it's really an opportunity for people to, to have an impact on what's happening during this time. So a lot of these studies and meetings will, will help set up potentially the 2020 budget, that which will right. be the That's governor's right. budget. That's right. It'll, it'll be, uh, it will be legislation of all sorts will be coming as a result of, of the study. There was a legislator years ago who didn't like studies and he, he was very colorful. He'd rant and rave against studies. He said, because studies are just rehearsing the orchestra to be ready to play the tune. But I tell you, in a part-time citizen legislature, it's really important to rehearse mm -hmm. and, and get ready to play the it's, tune. So I, I thank agree. you each for the questions you've thrown my way and encourage people to look at those websites that we've put up and realize that there's a great deal happening in May and June and July and August and September and October and November and December. The budget comes out and then January the session is here again. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you 